Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. I'm so excited uh, to speak this Father's Day. It's always an honor when I have the opportunity to share on Father's Day because, you know, this year is my first Father's Day with two little kids. One's not running around quite yet, but she's crying around, if you know what I mean, Um, because she's like a newborn baby. She's like two months old, almost three months old. Um, But happy Father's Day. We're so excited, and we just want to honor all you dads out there. Um, And one thing about dads is, is dads like jokes, and the jokes that dads like are the funniest jokes of all time, right? You know what I'm talking about? Um, dads are the funniest people on the planet. I believe it. I truly believe it because their jokes are hilarious. And so I got some jokes today that I want to share with you. Um, other than dads, you might not appreciate them, but dads will appreciate them. And if you don't, I apologize that you don't appreciate these jokes. But, um, this one is, what do you call a rude cow? Beef jerky. (laughs) That's like, that's like hilarious. Okay. I saw that, I burst out laughing by myself. And I don't laugh out loud very often, like by myself, okay? Like I'll watch a show, not even laughing, I was laughing. And then I thought this was so funny too. What days are the strongest to be Saturday and Sunday because the rest are weekdays? <laughs> like that's also so funny. I was laughing in my office as well. And then what do you call a factory that makes okay products? A satisfactory. <laughs> Okay, that's really funny too. It's not terrible, it's funny, okay? <laughs> so funny. Why do seagulls fly over the ocean? Because if they flew over the bay, they, we'd call them bagels. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, I might have to end because everything's just hilarious. What's the best thing about Switzerland? The answer is, I don't know, but the flag is a big plus. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. But anyway, I just want to honor all you dads out there, all you fathers out there. And it's a special time that we get to honor um, dads and fathers as part of our service. We get to celebrate our mothers, and now we're in June. We celebrate, you know, the fathers. And I was looking at just one statistic. I was wondering how many um, children in uh, Canada, according to Statistics Canada, uh, grew up without fathers. And the answer kind of shocked me. It's actually 12.8% of kids grew up without fathers grow up in fatherless homes, and that's such a sad statistic, but that's why today we honor you fathers who have pushed through, because being a father, being a mother, being a parent is extremely difficult, and I want to just honor you today for stepping up to the challenge and fighting, even when it was difficult, for waking up, even when it was difficult, for the sacrifice that you make, because it makes an impact on people in a dramatic and powerful, powerful way. And so we just want to honor you fathers today. We want to thank you again for the love and sacrifice that you pour out to your children. And of course, as fathers know, none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. There's a lot of times we blow it as fathers, but you know, we still have serve an incredible God who, who, who's there for us no matter what. But today I want to share a message with you today called Desperate, Humble, and Faithful. And this, this story Um, I'm going to be preaching from the story of Jairus in the Bible. If you know Jairus, he was a father that that came up uh, in the Bible. um, And and just some of the things that he did um, in response to his kid. His daughter is sick and and she's dying. And this is the story of of Jairus. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Mark uh, chapter 5, verse 21. Uh, And so we're going to be kind of reading through this entire story today. Um, But this is the main part of it right here. It says, Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue whose name was Jairus arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. He says, "My my little daughter is dying. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. You know, we see this man, if you, this man Jairus, right? He, he he's approaches Jesus in the state of emergency. I think we've all had moments, maybe as parents, as fathers, where we're in a state of emergency when it comes to our children. A state of emergency where maybe they're sick or a place where they've hurt themselves or a place where they're not following the way that they, we thought they would go or they're making decisions that we wish they wouldn't make. So he goes to Jesus with his sick child, his only daughter, saying, Jesus, heal my daughter. 
this desperate space that he finds himself in. If only you can lay your hands on my daughter, then she can be healed. And there's three kind of aspects of Jairus' character that come out in here that I think will help all of us um, as parents, those of us who are fathers, help us um, when it comes to loving our kids and how, what do we do when times become desperate? What do we do when, 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 the, when the emergency for our children or something around us gets difficult? How can we respond to it? And the first thing that Jairus did is he actually responded. He was desperate, right? Jairus approaches Jesus in the space of desperation, Maybe he had tried other options for his daughter. Maybe he had tried, you know, people who said they could heal or the doctors or tried the medication. Or he tried maybe even some spiritual practices to try and bring healing to his daughter. But maybe in his mind, because he was a local leader, he was powerful, he was influential. He maybe in his mind he said, I can't go to Jesus because Jesus is just for poor people. Jesus is just for people who don't really know how to use their brains properly. That's who Jesus is for. I have the title. I'm powerful. I have the influence. I can't go to Jesus. Why? Because if I go to Jesus, in my mind, I will become weak. Maybe he had had these thoughts rolling through his mind, and maybe you've had those thoughts before as well. Maybe he had the thought of, I can heal her myself. I can buy her healing. I can pay for it because I got the money. I got it all. I can pay for her healing. But eventually Jairus gets to this point of deep desperation where nothing has worked. I know if my daughter was sick, I would try everything I could to try and make sure she could get better. Right? Everything I could think about. I would do whatever it took, even if it meant my own sacrifice to find healing for my daughter. And I think Jairus probably did the same. And he thinks, okay, I'll do whatever it takes. So in an act of desperation, he throws himself at the feet of Jesus. And it says he pleaded fervently with him. Now this word fervently is defined as very enthusiastically or passionately. He didn't just throw himself at Jesus in like the space of like the unknown and the space of like trying to be comfortable. He went all in. He was a mess in the presence and at the feet of Jesus, all for his daughter. Whatever it takes. He thinks, I may look weak in the eyes, or in the eyes of those around me. I may look weak in the eyes of those who follow me and look up to me, but none of it matters if my daughter isn't with us. So with this place of desperation, he throws himself at Jesus' feet. And maybe if he has this thought of maybe. What if he plays his hands on her and he's healed? Then I'll get what I always wanted. This place of desperation leads us to do many things, right? You ever been in a desperate place? It leads you to do a lot of things that you never even thought were possible, things that you never even thought you were capable of. Desperation drives us towards something. But the question is, what does desperation drive you to in your life? Because desperation, oftentimes for us, it drives us all often to the wrong space. You know, there's this ethical dilemma that's been around for a long time and it's widely debated, right? It's this, would you steal a loaf of bread in order to feed your family? Big question. Really, this is a dilemma of desperation. What would you do in your most desperate moment? I think a lot of us, we strive so hard. We try as hard as we can in our own power and in our own ability and in our own strength to try and control everything around us that when something falls out of our timeline, when something falls out of the way that we want it to go, we start doing the wrong things and Jairus finds himself in a place of saying, you know what? Jesus is the answer that I have. When we get to a place of just desperation, our pursuit has to be towards Jesus. And sometimes we're going to fall at his feet and we're going to be a weeping mess. But oftentimes that's the most powerful and beautiful place that we can find ourselves. When you get desperate, pursue Jesus. I encourage you to let your desperation lead you to your knees at the feet of our Savior. Lead you into communion with your father. And then the second attribute that Jairus showed here was this thing of humility, right? He falls at the feet of Jesus. Again, he was a well-known religious leader. He was, you know, most likely a Pharisee. He was, he, he, he was so well-known in the land, one of the leaders in the local synagogue, in the local temple. 
and there was a big crowd around. You know, it wasn't like he threw himself at Jesus in private. He threw himself at the feet of Jesus in public, in front of everyone, in front of the town, in front of all the people around him. He, he threw himself at his feet. And at Jane's daycare this past week, they had a Father's Day celebration on Friday. And Beth and I were out of town, so we missed it. But Beth showed me the pictures and some of the videos from the celebration. And if you know me, this is just like not me. They, uh, they showed these videos and pictures of the dads doing potato sack races in the daycare. And me playing musical chairs. And Beth shows me these and I'm like, whew, good thing I wasn't there. Because that would have been embarrassing and I probably would have tried to say no. Right, because I was like, I don't want to play, do a potato sack race. I'm a grown man. I'm not going to play musical chairs. What if I lose? That would be embarrassing in front of my daughter. I can't lose in front of her. Wow, I'm so glad I was not there for that. That was literally my first thought. But then there's this other part of me that was like, who cares what everyone thinks if it's going to bring joy to my daughter, Right? Like, who cares, like, like, if I make a fool of myself? Like, who cares if I, if I just become this, like, crazy guy at daycare? Like, like, if my daughter is a part of it, it's really important. And a lot of us, we're not willing to humble ourselves when we think something's going to embarrass us or when we think someone's going to find out how weak we are. We're not willing to walk in humility because then people will see the deepest, darkest parts of us. They're going to start to see the truth about us. And so we say, no, I'm just going to pretend. I'm going to walk in pride. I'm going to show off everything I have. Some of us, we think the same way Jairus did. Maybe Jairus had this thought, I can't throw myself at Jesus' feet. The people from my synagogue are here. The people from my workplace are watching. The people in my family are watching me. I can't praise Jesus in this moment. I can't post on social media how much I love Jesus. I can't do that. What if someone sees You know, again, Jairus was most likely a Pharisee, right? And if you remember, Pharisees and Jesus didn't have, they had an interesting relationship throughout Scripture, the Pharisees and Jesus. In fact, most of the New Testament is them asking Jesus questions and him responding with more questions and stories. And then them trying to kill him. Like, that's like the New Testament relationship, Jesus and the Pharisees. This step for Jairus was a real act of humility. I don't care what people might think. I don't care if it ruins my reputation. I don't care if it shrinks my following. I don't care. I'm going to humble myself before the Lord. And in James 4.10, that's exactly what it says. This, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. Some of us, we just want to be lifted up in honor, right? Right? We want people to notice us. We want our boss to give us the pay raise and the promotion. And we want to get everything we have. We want to be lifted up. And God says, if you want to be lifted up, Humble yourselves. There you will find honor. In the humble place, you will find honor. Jairus throws himself at the feet of Jesus in an act of humility saying, God, I'm so desperate for you. I'm so desperate for a miracle in my life. Please come and pray for my daughter. God lifts those who are willing to humble themselves. Let us learn to humble ourselves before the Lord. We might not have the answers, right? We, are not, not, we might not have the answers to everything that's going on around us. We might not understand it. But one thing we can always do is throw ourselves at the feet of our Savior and say, God, I trust you. I trust you. And then the third kind of attribute Jairus shows here is faith, he's faithful. He says, if you come, Lay your hand on her. She will be healed. I'm putting all my eggs in this basket, right? This is the end. Like, like if you know the rest of the story, this is like the very end of his daughter's time here, right? This is active desperation. I'm going to, you will heal her if only you can lay your hand on her. Question for those of us who are parents in this room is that do you trust God to take care of your children? Do you trust him? Do you trust him to protect your child? Do you trust him to provide what your children need? Do you trust him? You know, for me, as I've learned as a parent, I'm a new parent, 
I often find it easier to trust God with my future than the future of my kids. Right? Because I think every, not every parent, but a lot of parents, we're so sacrificial in how we live, which is good. But what that does is that sometimes what happens is we stop trusting God because we sacrifice all that we are, which again, isn't negative, but then we don't allow God to actually step in and be there for them. What happens is that for a lot of us, our kids look to us as their savior rather than God as their savior. We have to learn to trust God with our children. Do you believe that he will provide for them? Do you believe he will protect them? Because the reality is, and you learn this quick as parents, you will not always be there. As your children get older, the less they will rely on you, the less they will need you. So the question is, what are you teaching your children? Are you teaching them to live with faith or are you teaching them to live with fear? Because the lessons that they learn in their home will be with them forever. The lessons they learn in their house will be with them forever. And do you know what? The reality is they may not always abide by the things you taught them in your home. I'm living proof of what my mom taught me. And I was like, I'm going to do the opposite of that because that sounds boring. Your kids might not always listen to what what you taught them, but what you taught them will always be inside of them. They may not always listen to what you have said, but our role is to teach them while we have them so they can live it out as they grow older. You know, the other night, Jane, she woke up about two in the morning and she'd woke up from a scary dream. And I don't know if you've ever had like a two-year-old try and explain a dream to you. It's pretty confusing, right? Like, you're like, there's, there's, there's hot dogs and you're scared, right? Like, like for real, it's like, like, like I'm trying to understand what you're saying. And so I didn't understand fully what she woke up. She was nervous though. So I spent a few moments. I didn't just be like, go back to bed. I spent a few moments. I laid in her bed and we had a conversation. I was telling her how much Jesus loves her and how much God will protect her. And you know, God is there for you. And we prayed together in her room and she prayed. And it was this powerful moment for me as a father of just teaching my child. There's gonna be scary things that come. There's gonna be things that come up that our natural reaction is to walk in fear, but we have to realize who we serve and that Jesus is always there for us no matter what. And it's this moment I tried to teach her in that moment, a small moment. But there's some heartbreak for a parent when their child wakes up scared from a dream or they come to you with some fear for their future. And we need to teach our kids, that that, that, teach our kids the faith that we have that God will come through. And faith that he will protect us and take care of us. And our faith has to be the, has the power to move mountains. And again, Matthew 17, 20. You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. This is right after they tried to cast a demon out of a guy and it didn't work. They're like, God, like Jesus like, why? And he's like, you don't have enough faith. I tell you the truth. If you had a, even, faith enough as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. You know, that's the faith I want to teach my children is that no matter what you go through, no matter what comes your way, have faith that God is gonna move and he's gonna provide when you need it. The faith that you have might be small right now. It might not feel like you have a lot of faith, but what you have is enough. Allow your faith to move the mountains in your kids' lives, to share your faith with your children, to share your stories of miracles and share your stories of pain and heartbreak, but how you saw God come through and provide and be there for you in your hardest moment. The things that God did in the midst of it all. Share the stories of the mountaintops and share the stories how God brought you out of the valleys. And if we continue in the story in Mark chapter uh, chapter five, it says, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay for them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that that she had had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing against you, man. Like there's a lot of people who have touched your robe. 
Who touched me? This is the, like, how do you ask this question? How are you unaware? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Can you imagine, like, imagine everyone else standing there like, I touched his robe by accident. Right? Like, I can imagine, right? Who touched my robe? The lady's like, I'm out of here, right? And everyone's like, I did, but like, do I put my hand up? Like, was it me? Like, did I get healing? They're like, looking. He kept looking around as he had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened, came and, her, uh, uh, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told them what she had done. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Now, there's so much just in this and we don't have time to get into all of it today, but we don't get a lot of insight in this moment of how Jairus felt, right? We don't fully, un- we, we don't get much insight. How did Jairus feel when Jesus is standing in a crowd asking who touched my robe while just short distance away his daughter is dying? We don't, we don't get how we felt. We don't get much insight. I can imagine him thinking, Jesus, like, what about me? How come, how come you're taking this time? Like, we're in, a, we're in a time crunch here, bro. Like, my daughter is dying. And you're spending time asking who touched your robe? He's probably like, I touched your robe. Let's go, right? Like, I was me. Let's go. I need you, Jesus. Why are you wasting your time with this lady? And really, according to a lot of the Jewish law, she shouldn't have even been in the city with a bleeding problem. She was an outcast. So maybe he looked at her and said, Jesus, this girl isn't even supposed to be here. She's an outcast. I'm famous. I'm the pastor. I'm the priest. Why are you wasting your time with somebody who doesn't even deserve it? What about me? Maybe that's what he was thinking. Maybe he had compassion on her. Maybe he knew how she was sick for 12 years. My daughter's 12 years old. Maybe he had this, this thought of, wow. She's been sick for as long as my daughter's been alive. What a miracle. God, thank you. Jesus, thank you. Maybe he was happy. Maybe rather than, 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 than something that squashed his faith, maybe it was something that built his faith. If God can do it for her, what about my daughter? Maybe that's how Jairus was thinking and contemplating and trying to understand what was happening. But the part I find so fascinating about this story is when Jesus looks at this woman, he says, he calls her daughter. Now for Jairus, that may have been kind of even like a triggering thing to say. Daughter. He's probably like, what about my daughter? He says, daughter. Why are you calling her daughter? What, what about my daughter? And I think the understanding Jairus had in this moment is that he learned Jesus cares about everyone. Jesus cares about the outcasts. He cares about the poor. He cares about the rich. He cares about the famous. He cares about the educated. He cares about the uneducated. He cares about the religious leaders. He cares about the thieves. He cares about the addicts. He cares about the sick. I think as parents, as fathers, as mothers, as people, we have to learn how to love other people's kids as much as we love our own kids. And you know how hard that is? When some kid's kind of being mean to your kid and you're like, I'm gonna go talk to your mother, you know? Is this your kid? You know what I'm talking about? It's hard to love other kids sometimes. Because I think there's this grace you have for your own kids when they're being annoying, right? But when it's someone else's kid, you know what I'm talking about? It's like harder sometimes to be patient with someone else's kid when they're being more annoying yeah exactly we have to learn how to love other people's kids that's part of why i love our 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 known kids here run by patricia you know she does an incredible job loving our kids and teaching them in the way of jesus we have an incredible kids program let's just give it up for uh patricia and our kids leaders you know we're blessed because we have a team here that loves your kids Loves your kids. If we continue in the story, uh, verse 35, says, while he was speaking to her, this is the most heartbreaking moment as a parent, messengers arrived from, from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter is dead. 
There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him and uh, go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw the commotion and the weeping and the wailing, the chaos. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. Then the crowd, the crowd laughed at him. But he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. It's the most chaotic moment, right? Like I try and picture myself in these stories. You, you, you're Jairus and you see Jesus is on his way to heal your daughter, right? He's on his way. You got him. You finally got time with the teacher. You finally got time with Jesus. And then he takes a moment to talk to a girl who's been healed from 12 years of bleeding. And as you are experiencing this wonder of this moment, you look up and you see running, coming from the distance, messengers, and you know it's probably not going to be good news. So they come to him and they say, hey, Jairus, she didn't make it. Your daughter didn't make it. The most horrific words I think a parent, a a father, a mother could hear, she didn't make it. It's heartbreak, right? It was too late. I should have gone sooner. What if I got Jesus sooner? What if he hadn't stopped to help this lady? Would we have made it? The last kind of thought I have for us today is this, is we've got to learn how to listen to the right voice. Whose voice are you listening to for your children? Whose voice are you listening to? There's a lot of voices, right? Telling us about our kids, doctors and teachers and siblings and even us as parents. We have to learn to listen to the right voice. The voice that says, don't be afraid. Have faith. Believe, trust me, I got you. I'll take care of you. Trust me. This voice that God is speaking to Jairus in this moment. I will take care of your kid. I love your kid more than you do. She's just sleeping. So Jairus is like, Imagine the like whirlwind of emotions, right? Like you'd be like, man, I don't even know what to do. Like I'm on a roller coaster. And then you show up to your house and there's just wailing and screaming, which is very common for Jewish culture. The wailing, the commotion. And you know what Jesus does? He says, get out of here. They're laughing at Jesus, to be honest. Jesus does not care. He's like, she's sleeping. And they're like, yeah, right. She is dead. We know dead and she's dead. And so he shows and Jairus is there with the disciples. He says, get out of here. And they walk into the room. You know, Jesus has the ability to push away the negative voices around you. The voice is telling your, child, telling your children that they aren't smart, that, they, that they're never going to graduate, that your child may never walk. The voice telling you that your child will never get a good job. The voice is telling you that your child will always live at home. These voices are so loud sometimes. And what we do is we throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus. And he quiets the voices. And he says, don't be afraid. Just have faith. The crowd might be laughing. But Jesus can quiet those voices and tell them to leave. And this is how the story ends. In verse 41, holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum which means little girl, get up. You know, what's interesting is you don't see the translation happen very often throughout scripture, the original to what it is now. Some scholars believe that this statement, Talitha Kum, was the same statement that Jairus may have said to his daughter when he was waking her up in the morning, maybe to go to school or to get ready for the day. Little girl, get up. Same statement. We don't know for sure, but it might be that same statement. He says to her, little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened, and then he told them to give her something to eat. 
This is the end of this story, right? She's, she lives, she's healed. Jesus makes it. You know, I believe that God will always come through. For that her healing came through the desperation and the humility and the faith of her father. Willing to be desperate for his kids, to, to be humble and to be faithful for his kids. <coughs> as parents and as fathers, let us become desperate for our kids' futures, for them to follow Jesus, for them to find Jesus, to find healing. Desperate enough to be humble, to throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus in a fervent plea for safety and protection for our children. And let us learn to have faith and trust that God will come through for us and will come through for our kids. We got to learn to trust God with our children. You know, our takeaway today is this. Our kids need parents that are desperate, humble, and faithful. And maybe you don't have kids here. But I think the world needs people who are desperate, humble, and faithful to see Jesus reach them and meet them where they are. Our world is in desperate need of people willing to humble themselves, willing to spread faith and to be desperate enough to sacrifice in order to see people find Jesus. So again, today we honor you fathers today. We honor you parents. We honor just all of us today as we go forward, learning how to just walk in the same ways maybe Jairus did of humility and desperation and faithfulness. And so I'm excited, um, just even for this Father's Day, we're excited that we're going to be eating some bacon today. We've got some root beer floats today. And we're going to be also um, giving away this, uh, it's a bullet smoker. I kept calling it a barbecue, but Beth was like, it's not, it's a smoker. I'm like, it's the same thing. I don't know the difference, right? Like, I don't know. I don't, Sean's like, I don't own a barbecue. Neither do I. Like, last time I barbecued was many moons ago. Like, it's been a long time. I had a barbecue and then we sold our house and we didn't bring it with us. And now we don't have one. And I got this for free and I was like, I'm good. You know, like I'm, I'm good. So all I say is if you win it, please cook me some, some meat in it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us. I want to pray for our fathers uh, today. So if you're, if you're sitting beside, beside your spouse, I just want you to maybe hold their hand and I'm just going to pray for our fathers and just pray for us all together. But really just a special prayer for our fathers today. So God, first of all, we thank you. Um, that we can learn how to become better parents, how we can learn to become better people, how we can learn to become better followers of you. So God, I pray that you help us all become humble, you help us all become desperate, and you help us all be faithful. But God, today we pray for our fathers. We pray for our fathers who are tired. We pray for our strength. We pray for our fathers who are weary. We pray for rest. For our fathers who, 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 who are angry, God, we pray for peace. For the fathers who are struggling, God, we pray for breakthrough. God, we just pray for our fathers today and God, we just pray blessing over our fathers today. Protect them, protect, protect their minds, protect their hearts and help them really just be beautiful examples of you and your love and your goodness and your greatness in our homes. In Jesus' name, amen.